Professor Ted Prowatt, uh, Assistant Professor of Computer Game Design at George Mason University. Honored to have the director of our program, uh, Director Sang Nam, here attending, and my fellow colleague, uh, Greg Rimsey. Thank you uh, for attending the talk. Okay, so to set the scene of this, I'd like you to either close your eyes or imagine. I'm going to kind of take you back to the early morning hours of April 14, 1912, when Titanic sank. So in the darkness of the early dawn hours, a foreboding energy began to settle across New York like a thick fog as news outlets began receiving word of a major event that was unfolding just minutes into the new morning of April 14, 1912. The Marconi wires, the Twitter of their day, began transmitting an associated press bulletin and sending out messages of an unimaginable and significant event unfolding in real time on one of the major Atlantic passenger shipping routes. Wireless operators on their late night shifts sailing on ships in the northern Atlantic huddled at their telegraph apparatus. Sitting under the warm glow of a tantalum light bulb, they were shocked and amazed at what they were now hearing in their headsets. Trained to listen to the crisp, sonorous sound of wireless communication traveling through the ether, operators scattered up to 500 miles apart from one another had begun to hear a sharp cry for help breaking across the airwaves just past midnight from a ship with the call signal M-G-Y. Ships in the Atlantic now tuning to the high-pitched sing-song hum of the wireless frequency of M-G-I were able to immediately discern what those bleeps and blasts, a staccato-like arpeggio rhythm of dots sounding like a hive of bees in some sense in long dashes that signaled the clear cadence of a Morse code message began to mean. The wireless operator aboard NGI was transmitting what appeared to be a cry for help, repeating over and over again the shorthand Morse code call letters CQD, CQD. This abbreviation stood for an acronym that meant one dreaded thing in seafaring parlance. NGI was in some form of danger on the high seas, for the CQD call meant come quick, danger. NGI was the unsinkable ship traveling with great fanfare on her maiden voyage. At 12.17 a.m., the second message came passing through more clearly, expressing the event that has caused the CQD call and urging quick action for any listening party. At 12.17 a.m., CQD, CQD, SOS, Titanic position 41.44, Northwest 50.24, West, require immediate assistance. Come at once. We struck an iceberg, sinking. The ether in that crisp, clear, frigid night of a thousand stars quickly began to light up as certain ships were able to respond to the CQD and rouse the attention of their captain. Knowing that Titanic, a payon to man's prowess and skill in engineering, often repeated in newspapers as the largest man-made moving object in the world and cast virtually as unsinkable, had struck an iceberg and was taking on water seemed almost inconceivable at the moment. So much so that the wireless operator on board the eventual rescue ship Carpathia had to verify if this come quick danger message was true or not. Carpathia, do you require assistance? The report from Titanic's operator was short but emphatic. Yes, come quick. So that's my opening. So what does Titanic have to do with serious games? So I'm gonna talk about this approach that I've taken with this serious game that I'm working on uh, regarding Titanic. For the past six years, I've modeled virtually on my own uh, the basic structure of Titanic from the boiler room to the boat deck to the hall to the smokestacks, and I'm still continuing to do that. But I believe that Titanic presents a wonderful opportunity for us to combine games and really serious games with STEM education. And I'm going to talk about the approach that I'm trying to take with this project as I develop it. Um, I wanted to show uh, this image. This was taken by Father Brown just before he disembarked Titanic at Southampton. And I just thought it was interesting being at the East Coast Games Conference uh, that you can see how embedded games are in culture. Uh, here's a boy spinning. And actually this was referenced if you watch the Titanic movie by James Cameron you'll notice that he actually referenced that shot in the back, which is kind of a cool moment. Um, I've had a lifelong 
interest and passion for Titanic. It's drawn my imagination in many ways, and in some significant way, or maybe insignificant way, has led me to where I am today, to be able to create this environment in a virtual world, in a game. But Ken Marshall uh, was actually a consultant to the Titanic movie, and James Cameron drew on Ken Marshall's knowledge. He's a painter, he's an artist, an illustrator. And uh, these images before the movie, before the um, one that James Cameron made, were like wonderful entry points for me and my imagination. And some of the paintings he did of the sinking, and even from uh, Robert Ballard's expedition, where you couldn't actually see that far in the dark, under, you know, uh, deep below, he made the paintings of what the ship looked like now as it sits and rests on the ocean floor. But those, I think, were kind of my preliminary sense of maybe where I would be as a game designer. And this was a drawing I did at age seven. Uh, and <laughs> I'm proud of it because, you know, back then I, I was thinking in this way, but also this idea that, you know, what, it, what would it be like to set foot on Titanic if, if we could step into this world and see what that looked like? And so as I've uh, gotten into the field of serious game design, I found an intersection between education and learning and games that has been fascinating for me uh, and fascinating because it provides an amazing point of discovery, I think, for students in a classroom. And so the project goal is to spark an interest in science, technology, engineering, math at the middle school level through a serious game. And recognizing that most middle schoolers, that's a crucial moment in their education where they might, as many of you have done, decide that this is what you want to do. Uh, some teacher might provide an aha moment, a spark, uh, that might suddenly engage you in a way that said, this is exactly what I want to do. And so that's why it's crucial to think about middle school level education in STEM. And not in the traditional way. We can get ideas across, as I'll talk about, in visual ways, in ways that capture all learners. And that's also one of the goals of the project. Um, this is just a render I put together based off the Ken Marshall of my ship, and obviously I critique it a thousand ways. Um, it's still in development. I still have to punch the holes in the windows, but to do historical accuracy, you got to make sure you have everything in its correct space. So, um, so that morning, uh, this is a London, a famous photo taken in London. This was uh, Ned Parfait, actually, the newspaper boy. Uh, they had some history on him. Unfortunately, he would later perish in World War I. But this was a famous image, uh, Titanic disaster, great loss of life. And it was just shocking. I mean, it just, you know, here it had been uh, presented as the technological marvel of its day. And no ship uh, should have ever been presented as unsinkable, but that was part of the marketing. It was, in fact, sinkable. I think one of the reasons why they actually made that assumption was because they, they did in some respects, they were putting together three ships of Titanic size, the Olympic ship, the Titanic, and the Britannic. Yes, and I, there were some cost-cutting measures going on. In fact, they didn't extend the bulkheads all the way up, uh, as they later um, explained, that would have helped actually make the ship more um, watertight and unsinkable. Um, so this is, uh, National Geographic was the entry point for me into Titanic. And just kind of talking over this, um, again, I think that when we want to teach science, technology, engineering, and math, we should try to find the most compelling examples that would hold the aspects that we want to teach in, that, in these content domains. And this is called pedagogical content knowledge. So we want to look at how do we get this idea across to students in ways that they can understand. And that comes with this idea that I'll talk about in the big idea approach, which is the title of my talk, that I believe knowledge is transactional. In other words, there has to be some kind of transaction occurring for the learner. And a big idea provides that lens, that opportunity for transaction and a metaphor to open up the world, some phenomena in the world. And I uh, chose this image of a cave painting because I think in, summary, in so many ways, even today, you know, 60,000 years later, as game designers, we are the storytellers. I mean, this is the same piece that they were taking an instrument and a tool that allowed them to show 
their transaction with the world, and they made art. And as game artists and game designers, we're doing that same thing. We're taking the tools of technology to show that transaction with the world. And that's the wonder of games. Uh, so I presented this at this middle school STEM event, this demo. Um, I'm debating whether to share it because it still has some rough stuff that I need to work out. But what was exciting to see is with this big idea approach and the idea that knowledge is transactional, uh, these first two students here actually played through the demo first in the boiler room. And they're presented with a big idea question, which I'll, I'll show you here in a moment. Once they had done that, though, this new student just came to this group, and they're explaining what they saw, what they learned. And that was like wonderful to, to me to see. I mean, just the, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what I hope this would eventually achieve. But the fact that they were explaining what they discovered, um, that's the idea that knowledge is transactional. So I teach an introduction to game design course and a history of game design course. And in my introduction course, we do a unit on serious games with Mars. And I teach this approach, the big idea approach. It has to start with an eye-opening or surprising fact. And what I tell them is, right now, in terms of planetary science, we are living in one of the most fascinating moments. Uh, you can literally see, just today, there was um, you know, a new discussion about uh, you know, ice on, um, on Neptune, right? Or, you know, just these wonderful discoveries. And so you have to find what, an eye, what is an eye-opening or surprising fact. And one of those is the fact that if you were looking at Mars as an example, uh, that it actually has low gravity. And many middle school students start with this, and I'll, I'll talk about this example as well, talk about embodied understanding. So the issue that we have in teaching science to middle school students is if they can't see it, they don't know it exists. And so they come from a point of view of the experience of phenomenon we have on Earth. But we want to open them up. We want to show what water looks like, how many water molecules are in one drop of water. It's really eye-opening. It's like a, an incredible amount. So when you start with that eye-opening or surprising fact, like for example, uh, that all plants on Earth use gravity to bring them resources, that's eye-opening because when, you, when they look at Mars, they have to understand that in a low-gravity environment, growing plants actually changes. So you can start with that. And then an exploration of the real-world uh, phenomena that encapsulates the eye-opening fact. This is uh, typically conducted through research of some form. So you go to some of the what the experts have to say, like what a scientist has to say. And I tell my um, game design students that you'll find actually Scientists by nature talk in metaphors, so it's perfect for this approach. So they'll, you know, they'll identify a metaphor, and you can utilize that in the serious game to teach the content. So, for example, you can start with a really interesting question: What role might caves have played in the development of art? And again, just kind of using this as an example, I was actually putting this together for my presentation, and suddenly I happened upon this article in. What I kind of think is fascinating, as you get into it, in terms of learning, everything is, uh, is related to science, really. There's, there's a scientific explanation for any phenomenon or experience, and it's pretty fascinating. So I just uh, throw this in there about the eye-opening or surprising fact. Um, do cave acoustics play a role in the development of language? That's kind of an eye-opening idea, and something that you could focus on in terms of teaching science, how to sound travel and you get them to, to actually experience you know, the, the imagery of going into a cave to create art and having some form of communication that art is a form of communication would lead to that big idea. And so again, you, you can take that approach of presenting something eye-opening and following into the sciences. And then another one, ancient cave artists starved themselves with oxygen while painting. Uh, many game designers, <laughs> maybe you understand, they starved themselves with sleep <laughs> while making games. So how does this um, you know, field into game design? Well, technology can be the intermediary between the world uh, to begin that understanding of meaning making. And our devices, as you know, have increased our ability to sense the world around us and quantify this world in a new way. The ability to sense the world can become a way to interact with the phenomena that exists in the real world. Uh, the, the idea that a mobile device, device with sensors or 
for AR, VR, XR, can act as intermediary to the world as well. That we can mediate our interaction with the world and thus have a greater vocabulary in the form of sensorial information gathering for which to explain our world. So, you know, this opens up a whole realm of possibilities because students can actually see water molecules and what they might look like, but experience it in a game. And situated within the, within the core of this new way to extend our senses into the world means that big ideas become the lenses for understanding what information our mobile devices are sensing. And in reverse, it gives us a way to design things for our devices to greater sense and see our world. So part of what really sparked this was I was actually working on a NIH grant funded serious game to teach the effects of air pollution on health. And the middle school students didn't understand that our environment, our air is full of particulate matter. Again, if they don't see it, they won't know it's there. And so the idea that I talked with the team was, why don't you have a device like an AR or VR where you can actually hold it up and they could see what is contained in our air. And then you could actually teach the big idea and then turn it into a fun game, like maybe zap the pollen or, you know. So that's kind of what got me going into the power of, of this idea. So what's the aim of big ideas in teaching and learning? And, and I broke this down in a short um, description of uh, paper. First of all, it's readiness. So the aim of teaching big ideas in the STEM discipline should be to convince students that the role that knowledge plays in everyday life is open up to new and potentially exciting possibilities. That's the idea that knowledge is transactional. That in order to have the conditions we have on planet Earth, we have to have enough gravity to build an atmosphere. And other planets that can't have that amount of gravity can't build an atmosphere. So suddenly they can see something in the real world that they experience and look up in the sky and say, wow, that's pretty phenomenal. Then you can begin to talk about atmospheric pressure and what might we look like on a planet with low atmospheric pressure or very, very high atmospheric pressure. Or what happens when you go down deep into the sea with this kind of bone structure? What would it happen, ideally? I mean, you wouldn't have to be supportive like. But you can get into a whole a series of interesting and fascinating questions and the ideas in this approach become educative instruments that teachers and students can use to look at a particular scientific phenomenon in the world. And what the concept of an idea offers, as opposed to a concept or construct, is interactivity. Ideas thus become important because they connect the teacher and students to those regularities found in the world. And then the effect. It's the interest in most disciplines in the field of STEM, as I've mentioned, begin in middle school, if not sooner. So if we alter our view of disciplinary knowledge, that we can have access to it, and we can give students access to it, then we can change the way uh, students view classroom teaching and learning, because they play a role in that. And I think that this serious games give them that empowerment to say that I can manipulate this idea in a way that wasn't presented if it was just up on a board. I can actually get hands-on, and I can actually get feedback about how successful I was in manipulating that idea or experiencing that idea in real time. So. I was gonna play some genuine footage, but it, it is, I'll just keep moving along. Um, so how does this approach work? Well, uh, we start with the standards. The, every curricula has standards and objectives. And you start with the NGSS standards. And you can see here it contains three big ideas. Kinetic energy can be distinguished from the various forms of potential energy. Energy changes to and fro from each type can be tracked through physical or chemical interactions. The relationship between the temperature and the total energy of a system depends on the type, states, and amounts of matter. But this is the challenge. This is so dry, it actually makes me want to drink some water. Seriously. So what we need to do in, in a serious game designers and working with educators is get them to unpack that because otherwise it's not transactional. So um, you could start with an eye-opening or surprising fact about Titanic, like how much energy does it take to move essentially a skyscraper laying on its side through the water at 24 knots? So then you start with the idea that it's visual, right? You get them to visualize this. Wow, this is actually quite a huge object, right? 
then you can lead them into some other interesting um, eye-opening facts. The coal that takes a great ship across the Atlantic, 22 trains carrying 300 tons each. Look at that. Every time the ship needs to go across the Atlantic, it needs that much coal? So you're basically telling me that this clean energy is <laughs> that's made from water, these ships are actually just big containers for coal with passengers, some passengers on, uh, thrown in for good measure to justify the cost. <laughs> it's a very interesting problem of economics you know, that you could explore. Um, and then you could do something like this with the map. The boilers on the Titanic could at top speed generate 215 pounds per square inch. Doing the math and figuring that an NFL lineman could use their entire weight to hit another player with an area of five square inches, five by five equals 25 square inches, 25 times 215. They would need to weigh over 5,400 pounds. Well, my goodness. Um, and so with this kind of steam power, Titanic, the size of a skyscraper, estimated to weigh 52,310 ton, uh, tons, could move through the water at 23 knots per hour, or 26.5 miles per hour. And so again, you could teach, uh, we can teach about kinetic energy and also water, because we're gonna look inside the boiler room now. I'm gonna take people, um, students inside the boiler room, and they're gonna actually get the chance to experience some of this. So, you, you know, look at the three states of water, all created by potential kinetic energy. Steam, icebergs, magnetism, and the movement of the ocean played a decisive role in the sinking of Titanic, a ship that was hailed 110 years ago, now as the embodiment of human technology and creativity at the time. So you can pull in a lot of science. Energy equals coal plus water uh, to make steam. How does coal and water, you, and again, asking questions to students um, is the way that this leads in. So you provide, you first of all have to discover the eye opening or surprise of the fact. Then you have to work to get that into a core idea that you want to teach. And then to get that across, that idea that it's transactional, you try to find a compelling question to hook them in. And, um, this idea and approach was tested on a 24-hour weather plan piece where students were asked, when is it cold is in 24 hours? And they could actually take this idea to a rotate the earth. And many uh, middle school students, again, predicted that it was coldest um, at midnight because that's their association night. But it's actually early in the morning. And in testing this approach, when one student did this and saw that the, as the earth rotated, the temperature decreased, to um, show that it was early morning hours, They're, they said, holy cow, and they actually took the mouse at the time and like <laughs> took it over, because they wanted to see this phenomenon for themselves. So that's what you're trying to get them to, to see. And how does coal and water provide energy, as I said? Um, why are the big pieces of coal hacked into smaller pieces before being put into boilers? Okay. Again, the, the big idea of energy, there's so much you can do to it. Why was fresh water used to generate steam? And the first idea above helps students understand how the potential energy in coal and uh, carbon is converted to kinetic energy in the form of fire. You could also look at energy and magnetism. And this is something that actually literally is fascinating because the magnetic field wasn't able to really be fully understood until we could utilize the technology we've had in the last two years to actually visualize magnetic fields around Mars and Earth. And at the time, they didn't understand the magnetic field quite that well. And uh, one morning, I had this big, you know, big idea approach can produce an aha moment. And I woke up, I was like, of course, the reason you sank, you were made of iron. And, and actually, what they did was they tried to compensate for the fact that the ship was made uh, from iron by using these soft, on the binnacle, they had these soft um, iron balls to balance out the compass. But Titanic had a design flaw because the second compass that they needed to do the readings was 24 feet back. So by the time they got back after taking the reading to match it to the compass, the ship probably had moved like almost four football fields. And so one of the things is on the night of the sinking, Titanic was actually 13 miles off her reported position. And actually, that's why Robert Ballard struggled to find it. And that's why no one could find it up to that point. But um, you can do a lot with this. You can look into how you know, magnetics, uh, the magnetic field works and how magnetism is a really important property. So, so um, just 
just wanted to show, let's see here, how, oh, whoops. So this is something that, um, from a curriculum point of view, I put together for this, um, which is the idea that um, with serious games, we can use embodied understanding, because um, we're more likely to understand an idea when we actually get to experience it. So you can start with this idea, and again, this is something that I'm gonna put into Titanic, but for navigation, um, you know, it's as simple as looking up and seeing, setting a, a fixed point, which in this case, um, as Titanic was sailing, it was, I believe, Polaris, if I got it right, it's the North Star. Uh, and then they would adjust the angle between that view and the horizon. So you could actually have students understand this big idea by saying, okay, we're gonna start here looking off at this point on the wall, and as we get back farther, we're gonna see how that angle of our head changes. And you could get them to understand that that was how they were uh, using the navigation. Um, buoyancy was mentioned, very fascinating. Why doesn't Titanic sink? Well, it displaces a m the amount of water uh, according to its weight. Uh, you can put um, a metaphor in there. Um, the average pair of lungs can hold 1.7 gallons of air. We breathe in between 2,100 and 2,000 gallons of air each day. This amount is needed to supply oxygen so the 24 gallons of blood is pumped through the heart on a daily basis. So it's the idea that water displaces or pushes it out of the way. And uh, once that displacement was broken, the ship sank. Um, for coal combustion, the third set of science standards relates to coal combustion. Coal combustion, as I was actually up there, can be compared to human metabolism. So as it's taking in energy, it's actually burning energy and, and combusting that energy. Okay, so I will, uh, this is like kind of the rough demo, but um, Again, the one that was played at the middle school um, STEM event. Um, um, start off with presenting them with this uh, students with this big idea. Oops. Let's take a second. So for Titanic's maiden voyage, how much coal did it take to move essentially a skyscraper laying on its side at 24 knots an hour across the Atlantic from Ireland to New York? And what was neat was one enterprising student, uh, she said, are we talking about in the course of 24 hours you know, in one day? And that insight is a teachable moment. So again, what you're trying to do is give students that opportunity to have that teachable moment where they want to know more. It opens up something to them that they never thought before. And then again, this is it would maybe pre be presented in a much more interactive way. Um, to produce the steam power, as I mentioned, she had to consume a whopping 825 tons of coal per day. So they were able to see that, you know, these eye-opening um, ideas. And then what I was, what I'm trying to do is mix object-oriented programming and design with, uh, you know, serious games. So to see the idea of temperature and pressure, um, again, it's a little bit off, but you'd add more coal um, until it says boiler is at the perfect tension for temperature for producing steam for Titanic's engines, and then it will actually burn that coal and drop back down. And if you add too much coal, it'll say, uh, boiler's too hot, steam pressure's too high. Um, so that's one, that's one um, instantiation of that. I also have a cross-section of the boiler where they would actually see the cross-section of the boiler. I decided not to show that because um, as I realized, it, it actually I need to increase the accuracy of it because in one drop of water, there are so many water molecules. So we had originally had like six floating around. That gives the wrong impression. Um, so again, uh, that's the demo, and um, that's my talk, and I'll open it up for questions. I wanna say thank you. Hopefully that uh, gave you some insights into the process. Yes. Thank you.
was in Maine, my sense is that we're we're on the cusp of this. It's got a ways to go, um, but we're on the cusp of serious games really having an impact, I think, in a classroom. Um, it, you know, I would have liked that to happen five, ten years ago, but it's good to know that we're on that trajectory and pipeline. I think there are probably three things about that, and that's a really great point you bring up. One thing that I've thought about is that you provide the ability for students to have this and be able to simulate and you know simulate this. So you'd have a series of sliders where they could actually control for you know the energy of the of the coal and in the steam that's produced, um, and then see a sense of like what happens if they tweak those um, kind of pieces. So I think that that's the kind of middle component. The other uh, piece is to have something like a curriculum guide or even a series, a website that uh, teachers can access. So it, it boils it down so they can get these ideas out in front of students and then make it participatory, however they want to make it participatory, but then have access to you know these small demo pieces, in my opinion. Obviously, it'd be great to have it as a full experience, but what I was excited to see when I first presented this, because again, this was a very kind of raw, crude demo, uh, to see that they actually were able to get the big idea and get in interested by it and share it with other students. And that's kind of the first part of that. So I, I don't think it needs too much. Um, obviously, as a designer and a serious game designer, it would be great to have it. But I think if you have those kind of three aspects, and you can enlist teachers um, you know, to, to work with you on that and work on defining more what the curriculum they're teaching but it's a starting point, I think, for getting the students more engaged in, in interacting. Great question, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, we talked about the, the idea of finding a uh, IOT site practice mm -hmm. that would be interested in learning the game design. Have you ever thought of, uh, have you ever discovered topics that genuinely are really hard to find that in? And if so, how do you go about finding it? That's a great question. So, um, when I was working with the NAH group, they gave me a, 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 basically a math problem that was designed for high school students. It was physics based. Um, and I actually worked on the curriculum guide. And at first I was like, this is like, how are middle school students going to even grasp this? But what we did is I started looking into it and saying, okay, getting it down to a, a visual idea. So I was telling my students, like, yeah, it's the visualization piece that's so important because when you, when you can see something, you understand at least its features. So it was the idea of like how much air is cycled through the room in the course of an hour, and it was a math problem. But then I started constructing like an actual um, you know, series of images and showing that, you know, imagine that the air is a big cube, and if it goes into this volume of space, it's going to be filled up pretty quickly. So I was able to take that to your point, when you can take it into that eye-opening, surprising idea and then visualize it creates a visualization of it, you're almost halfway there. Even though the, the metaphor of the big idea doesn't have all the features of it, it's enough to get them to begin to orient themselves towards what you want them to understand. So, yeah, I, I could pull that guide up in a minute. <laughs> yeah, great question there. Yeah. Anyone else? Good to go? No, anything else? Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it.